the New World Order is a thing, and not everybody who talks about it is an anti-Semite. New World Order. A new world order. The new world order. The new world order. New world order. A new world order. New world order. If ever you mention the term New World Order, people tend to look at you like you've taken leave of what little sense you've got, given up rational thought in favour of dribbling, and have been using your brain as a psychedelic sieve. This is understandable, because the idea that a hidden cartel of the so-called global elite control the world's economy and its political agenda is beyond imagination for most. Thankfully, for those who care to retain an open mind, there's no need to employ imagination, because the historical evidence which establishes the fact is unequivocal. In 1902, one of the world's richest men, Cecil Rhodes, made provision in his seventh will to create a transatlantic partnership of bankers, industrialists, politicians, military leaders, academics, artists and media moguls to set about creating a one-world government. The evidence documenting their activities and those of the round table movements and various think tanks they spawned, such as the Council on Foreign Relations and the Royal Institute of International Affairs, is all in the public domain. Which kind of makes the allegations that those who talk about it believe in secret conspiracies rather silly. It's no secret. Of course, if you ever actually point to this well-documented evidence, the best you can hope for is that you will be called a loony conspiracy theorist. In these modern days of mass media, which is like an anti-thinking soup of stinking soundbites, government-sponsored fairy tales, and Pied Piper-inspired corporate self-sacrifice incantations, it is far more likely that you will also have the label of anti-Semite slapped on your bewildered forehead. People who highlight that world leaders have been selling the idea of a new world order for generations must be labelled anti-Semites. As is often the case these days, that accusation is both untrue and a tactic deployed by the world's compliant mainstream media and political talking heads to divert attention away from the actual issue. The actual issue being that there really are people actively pursuing global power. By pretending that such concerns are hate crimes, rather than going anywhere near discussing the mountain of evidence which clearly shows that the New World Order is a thing, the obvious objective is to convince everyone else that only anti-Semites question global financial institutions. Therefore, if you ever mention this down the pub, you deserve to be thrown out onto the streets with the heckles of trigger defence victims echoing in your ears. Apparently, the notion that immensely wealthy people who are capable of manipulating global markets also possess the capacity to hold a meeting, to discuss other ways of making themselves even more wealthy, and to plan how to wrestle further power and influence away from the window-licking masses, is so outrageous it must be denied at all costs. So the New World Order means different things for different people. For globalist world leaders, it is the promise of them being able to control absolutely everything, so that they can make the world what they want it to be and live happily ever after. For the people called anti-Semites, who have bothered to find out what world leaders have been talking about for generations, this utopia doesn't sound so appealing primarily because the people who have been in charge for the last 150 years keep killing millions of people and have shown no great enthusiasm to stop doing it. Obviously pointing this out makes you an anti-Semite. A much larger group of the Earth's population who have swallowed the monumentally idiotic lie that the concept of the New World Order is an anti-Semitic trope don't think the New World Order is real. Happy to point a clueless accusatory finger at anyone who tries to warn them that the global elite are actually a bunch of parasitic robber barons who have amassed their global power by operating a Ponzi scheme called the Global Monetary System, they will no doubt be surprised when they discover that sustainable development means depopulation as far as the New World Order are concerned. 
absolutely terrified of ever being perceived as anti-Semitic by their mates, these people have been programmed to actually believe it is impossible for immensely powerful globalists to conceive of a plan and execute it. Anyone who suggests that they are in fact quite capable of doing so must be an anti-Semite, and everything they say is crazy, and any evidence they point to is made up. By the time these people realise that the New World Order is actually real, it won't matter because they will have given away all semblance of democratic control to a one world government, who promises to save them from the climate emergency. An emergency first clearly proposed by the globalist New World Order think tank, the Club of Rome, in 1991. Clever, really. Of course, this doesn't mean that anti-Semitism isn't real, nor that there aren't a few nutters who really do think that there is a Jewish plot to enslave humanity. These people are usually easy to spot because they have a tendency to say things like, there's a Jewish plot to enslave humanity. They goose step down the high street or get dressed up as Nazis, even when they aren't going to a party. The vast majority of people who do know what the New World Order is don't think, do or say any of those things. However, for the swathes of humanity who know absolutely nothing at all about the New World Order, that niggling doubt always remains. This is because some members of the New World Order are actually Jewish. Most aren't, but rabid anti-Presbyterianism doesn't really have the same emotional impact so false allegations of anti-Semitism is the preferred deflection strategy. Beaten into total intellectual and emotional submission by the controlled media who are employed to keep them on track, the populace at large thinks that anyone who criticises a Jewish person for their political or economic policy decisions or perhaps their attempts at social engineering must therefore be anti-Semitic because criticising anyone who happens to be Jewish, whether you give a flying fart or not about their Jewishness, definitely means you're anti-Semitic. It said so on the TV. The fact that this is the logical equivalent of assuming anyone who criticises Boris Johnson is anti-Christian, or believing that those who find Prime Minister Modi's policies a bit alarming are anti-Hindu, doesn't matter. Logic and good sense tend to fly out of the window once your offence trigger has been squeezed. The anti-Semitism labelling of anyone who criticises power seems like an insane idea, but one that has been very successfully deployed by the immensely powerful people who don't want you to ever question anything they ever do or say. So, if mentioning the New World Order is anti-Semitic, Let's listen to a few people exercising their hate speech. For example, I have in my possession a secret map made in Germany by Hitler's government, by the planners of the new world order. And the hope that each of us has to build a new world order. Out of these troubled times, our fifth objective a new world order can emerge, a new era. We have before us the opportunity to forge for ourselves and for future generations a new world order. Now we can see a new world coming into view. A world in which there is the very real prospect of a new world order. The President George Bush has talked time and time again about the new world order. And this is the best chance to begin to establish the new world order. And after 1989, President Bush kept said, and it's a phrase that I often use myself, that we needed a new world order. As I've told you before, because I love it so much, they also created the Great Seal of the United States. And that Great Seal of the United States has on it Nobus Order Seclorum, a new order for the centuries, for the ages, forever. Now much has been said by the Secretary of State and others about a new world order, about a defining moment in history. What kind of new world order we really create? 
With the end of the Cold War, Henry Kissinger pointed out in his superb book on diplomacy, he said, none of the most important countries which must build a new world order have had any experience with the multi-state system that is emerging. Never before has a new world order had to be assembled from so many different perceptions or on so global a scale. When really a new world order can be created, it's a great opportunity. It isn't just a crisis. There's a need for a new world order. The affirmative task we have now is, uh, is to actually um, uh, create uh, uh, a new world order. There is a chance for the President of the United States to use this disaster to carry out what his father, a phrase his father used, I think, only once, and hasn't been used since, and that is a new world order. Uh, and, and, and then President Bush, at the end of, the, of that war, promised he would give four graduation addresses, four commencement addresses, describing that new world order and what America's role was going to be in it. We've got to give them a stake in creating the kind of uh, uh, world order that I think all of us would like to see. I think even that, even that does not describe why the world has changed so much and why the world has turned so much toward a new world order and a new kind of civilization. But the point here is, it's not about me, it's about the idea of freedom. It's you, about the future of the whole region. It's about the future of Europe and a, a new world order. The transatlantic partnership was never just the foundation of our security. Out of it came a new Europe, a new world order. The pieces are in flux. Soon they will settle again. Before they do, let us reorder this world around us. I think a new world order is emerging, and with it the foundations of a new and progressive era of international cooperation. We have resolved that from today, we will together manage the process of globalization. It's what I believe is our destiny of success in this new world order. It is a new world order with significantly different and radically new challenges for the future. India and China are clearly becoming part of our new order. You know, world order is about a balance of power, but it's also about uh, commonly accepted rules about what ought to be the, the operating system of the world, how ought it to be set and changed. The Concert of Europe, quote, had a deeply conservative sense of mission. Based on respect for king and hierarchy, it prioritized order over equality, stability over justice. In your view, are those still the world's priorities? I think they need to be. We need to think about order very differently in the 21st century. That if you live in a world of globalization, to make a long story short, nothing stays local for long. If uh, you're India and you decide that your economy forces you to uh, generate a lot more electricity and the easiest way to do it is through coal, uh, this will have climate change consequences for everyone else. And we, what we want to do is set up, uh, set up these rules through consultations and negotiations. Here's what every sovereign entity, including the United States, is obligated to do. And uh, we'd agree to the set of behaviors and rules or norms. And then we'd also agree, how do we uh, incentivize countries to live up to it? How do we give them capacity if they lack it to live up to it? How do we penalize or deals, deal with those who, who violate it? And this present window of opportunity during which a truly peaceful and interdependent world order might be built. This would be the time because you really need to bring China into the creation of a new uh, um, uh, world order, financial world order. Uh, uh, recapitalize uh, the banks and, and then work on a better world order where we work together to resolve problems that confront humanity, like global warming. But it is the awareness itself that will drive the change. And one of the ways it will drive the change is through global governance and global agreements.
It, it's, it's past the point of talking. Um, we know historically that the global governance um, the sort of agenda um, to these issues is, is, is very hard to try and is, 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 with all the best intentions, it's very hard to actually activate. The European countries are binding together slowly, forming the EU. Eventually, we will see the rise of a single world government. 2009 is also the first year of global governance with the establishment of the G20 in the middle of the financial crisis. The climate conference in Copenhagen is another step towards the global management of our planet. Today Europe can propose the principles and rules that will shape a new global order. Le moment où tout le monde aura compris qu'il était temps de changer, temps de donner un nouveau visage à la mondialisation, temps de construire un nouvel ordre mondial, politique, économique, social, assis sur de nouveaux principes et de nouvelles règles. Au nom de l'Europe, en tant que président de l'Union Européenne, j'ai proposé que se tienne d'ici à la fin de l'année un sommet mondial pour que soient discutés et décidés ces nouveaux principes ces nouvelles règles. On, on a world level, I think it's absolutely necessary that we go in the direction of a network of regional organizations. We have the European Union in Europe, uh, maybe tomorrow in Asia we shall create an uh, Asian uh, currency uh, unit, uh, like we have the uh, Economic and Monetary Union in Europe. Uh, there is certainly also uh, an enormous uh, 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 intense uh, cooperation more and more in, in, in Latin America, uh, there are the Arab, uh, Arab countries. So I see uh, a world order in the future with a multipolar uh, world order. We can build the 21st century world order. The nature of the security threats we all face is completely different today from even a few years ago. Proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, new arms races, terrorist fighters, but also the impact of climate change. These are all security issues, probably the most pressing ones of our times. Because we can be somehow, and maybe more than others, a security provider at large. Today, I believe Europe knows that military means are sometimes necessary. And there is no ambiguity about that. We know that. And this is why we have, in the last two years, built at last the European defence. A dream that our founding fathers and mothers always dreamt of but never managed to accomplish. And now it's done. We have united as the European Union the second largest defence budget in the world. Together, joining forces, we are definitely uh, a superpower, economically and also in security terms. The Europe of Defence is now a reality with solid foundations and this is our contribution, the European Union contribution to the security of our citizens, first and foremost, but also it is our commitment to a more cooperative multilateral new world order. It is our commitment to a more cooperative new world order. Our commitment to a new world order. Our commitment to a new world order. New world order. New world order.